Hello and welcome to our episode of Healing Dreams Project with Billy Ortiz and Royce, Dr. Royce Fitz. My name is Viviana and today we are going to be discussing the toolkit that is necessary by created, originally created by Jeremy Taylor. So Billy, why don't you do our screen share so that we discuss these po very important points. Okay. So this is called the DreamWork Toolkit. It, there are the six basic hints for DreamWork. And uh, we, Royce and I, we've, we've trained and worked with Jeremy for many years. And we find this is the best way to work with dreams uh, because it gives us a chance to enter the dream as though we were the dreamer and all of our comments are in the first person as much as possible. So Viviana, you wanna read the first one? The first one says, all dreams speak a universal language of metaphor and symbol and come in the service of health and wholeness. There's no such thing as a bad dream only dreams that sometimes take a dramatically negative form in order to grab our attention. Royce, did you want to say anything about that particular one? So I'm, I marvel every time I read this, the whole dream work toolkit, because it's such an unsophisticated title and it's such a sophisticated presentation of dreams. And so this piece, this uh, first one, this universal language uh, has always captivated me and reinforces this belief that every dream from every person, from every culture, from every background, uh, every dream comes in the service of health and wholeness. And this blessing that Jeremy gave with his brilliant insight for us that there is no such thing as a bad dream is something that has to be kind of like drilled into us because when we're dreaming, part of the limbic system doesn't know we're dreaming and it reacts with that this dream is a waking life event. So we will emotionally feel all the waking life feelings and waking life feelings and bad stuff always hooks us. And this is a beautiful reminder that we can't stop the limbic system from doing this, but we can use our thinking and reminding ourselves that this is not a bad dream. It is a dramatically negative form and it helps me it grabs my attention. Yeah, very good. Mm -hmm. The second basic hint for dream work reads, only the dreamer can say with any certainty what meanings his or her dream may have. This certainly usually comes, or the certainty usually comes in the form of a wordless aha, of recognition. This aha is a function of memory and is the only reliable touchstone of dream work. Wow. Yep. That's, that's the, that's, I always say that's where the rubber hits the road. You know, it's like we can say whatever we want about someone's dream, but the dreamer gets the final word. And if the dreamer can take it or leave it, um, and and we it, when we say it's a function of memory, there's something in me that, on the unconscious level, knows that this is this is what the dream is trying to tell me. And when I hear someone say it aloud, then it's like, as though an electrical shock goes up my back, or I get the hair on the back of my neck stands up, or whatever, because it's like, oh right, that's it. So that's that's a really important piece that that the dreamer is is the only one who can say what their dream means. They're, they, they have their final word. Mm -hmm. And Billy, if I can just sneak in something here, this is where also, as you clearly said, this is where 
that it's not an expert on the external, on the outside, that knows the meaning of this dream. Only you, only me, only the dreamer. Right. Mm -hmm. Number three, there is no such thing as a dream with only one meaning. That's for sure. All <laughs> dreams and dream images are overdetermined and have multiple meanings and layers of significance. Mm. So this uh, one meaning piece is such a trap for all of us humans because I, many times I hear people say, well, Royce, I had this dream last night and eh, I know what it means. And it's like, yes, you do. And what you're remembering right now is only part of the meaning, but it is one of the many mean, mean, meanings of this. So the images, I, and I love Jeremy's term here, are overdetermined. It's like it's packed in. Yeah. packed in densely and that's on purpose and what we're ready for may be one meaning or five mm -hmm. there always are multiple meanings and layers of significance so when we do the always piece mm -hmm. that always helps to know you know we're doing great dream work in this instant Mm -hmm. And someday we may want to unpack even more because this dream is speaking to all the levels, many, many levels beyond what our conscious self has. Right. And that's why I always say that that's mm -hmm. why I love to work dreams in groups because mm -hmm. we get so many different perspectives on any dream. So if mm -hmm. we're, it's a group of 20 people, we might get 20 different perspectives. If it's a group of three, mm -hmm. we, we'll get three different perspectives at least. But I like to also say multi-layered and multi-dimensional because it comes on and we, we look at it from all angles. Mm -hmm. So when you say, you just use the word multi-dimensional and, and it's like what, you know, the dimension we know. Yeah. And it may be speaking from another dimension. That's it. I mean, because anything mm -hmm. can happen in a dream. I mean, I've worked many dreams where somebody says, well, you know, I'm driving in my car and they go, no, wait. I'm in the passenger seat and then they go, no, wait, no, wait, I'm in the back seat. And it's very possible that as the dreamer, I'm in all those places at the same time. That cannot happen in the waking world, but it can happen in the dream world. So that's why we say multi-layered and multi-dimensional because, you know, we're, we're outside of physical reality, physical, this physical reality. Mm -hmm. For me, it brings to mind almost holographic then. Would you add that? Yes. And you know, well, we, we're going to keep mentioning Jeremy <laughs> because this is Jeremy's realm here. But at, at, when I worked with him many times, he um, people would say, you know, I just have this little snippet of a dream and I don't think it's going to really say anything. And he, and he would often say, dreams are like holograms you can tear off one corner and you can still see the image through that one corner of the hologram by holding it up to the light and turning it around so yes holographic is a great a, a great metaphor or adjective to use okay number four no dreams come just to tell you what you already know how many times have you told me that billy <laughs> All, all dreams break new ground and invite you to new understandings and insights. Mm -hmm. Right. And we've alluded to this already. Uh, it is so tempting for the dreamer, me in this case, to have some kind of event during the waking life, my late waking life. And then I may dream about it or watching a TV show or reading a book. And it's like, oh, I know where that dream came from. And again, it's like, yes, that is part of where the dream came, comes from. And it, it's not talking to me about what I already know. It's using what I already know, maybe something that I'm more open to at that moment. Yeah. And then 
when I accept that it's not there just to tell me what I already know, it opens me up to the possibilities that the dream maker, whomever that is, myself, mm -hmm. the gods, the goddesses, the energies, the collective unconscious, all dreams are here to break new ground and to yeah. encourage my insight, open me up for understanding. And then it's like, ah, oh, these dreams aren't just routine, like a lot of scientists want to say. They're yeah. just routine dusts of the <laughs> of the uh, night. It's like they are, and they're also this. So let's honor the possibility of new insight out of a tiny simple dream. Yeah. Well, and this is the part where it gets paradoxical because at the beginning we're saying only a dreamer can say for sure what his or her dream means. But then we say no dream comes to tell us what we already know. So that seems like like a paradoxical comment. Mm -hmm. And it really what's happening is we're waking up the unconscious. And we got to keep remembering that um, it's this everything that we have in the dream comes from the unconscious realm. So yes, um, I, in fact, I worked many dreams and just yesterday, I worked a dream where a woman in the dream is walking along a riverbed and she sees some other people climbing up a cliff and she and hiking up this cliff and she thinks, oh, well, I can't join them because uh, my knees are, are not supporting me. And then she says, well, this, this dream, you know, we, somebody in the group says, well, then this dream is talking about the knee replacement surgery and and I, and I said, well, I have to say, this falls under the category of something I already know. I don't need my dreams to come and tell me I need knee replacement surgery. Um, it has to go past that because the, the dream can show me anything at once. So there has to be a metaphor attached to, the, to that situation in the dream. And, and that also speaks to me of how our waking self, the ego self, the self that has to function in this linear-ish world, uh, doesn't, it isn't relaxed enough to follow the dream's rules, which the dream has no rules. Right. And, right. and, and so we want to accidentally rigidly interpret it. And you're inviting us to say, and there's a metaphor. What's the metaphor of yeah. knees that don't work? or something. right well and i mean we're spending a bit of time on this one because it's important but um it falls under the the category of mistaken literalism as well because if i have a dream like i billy often have dreams about working on dreams and organizing workshops and ever since we started the idea of this pod blog podcast i have uh, had many dreams around the podcast so mm -hmm. I can easily just go, oh, okay, that, that means I'm on the right track. And, you know, sure, the, the dream world's voting for this. But I have to go deeper and I have to say, well, my dreams could have shown me anything. It chose this because it's up in my conscious awareness right now. Mm -hmm. However, there has to be more. And that's been tricky for me. That, this was probably, number four was probably the hardest one of the toolkit for me to really grasp mm -hmm. when I first started. Because mm -hmm. I kept thinking I knew what my dreams meant too. <laughs> And, and it's hard to give that up uh, just as a human and especially perhaps in our culture, uh, we're kind of trained to bite down on literalness. Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay, number five says, when talking to others about their dreams, it is both wise and polite to preface your remarks with words to the effect of, quote, in my imagined version of the dream, unquote, and to keep this commentary in the first person as much as possible. This means that even relatively challenging comments can be made in such a way that the dreamer may actually be able to hear and internalize them. It can also become a profound psycho-spiritual discipline. Quote, walking a mile in your neighbor's moccasins, unquote. We are so um, kind of uh, 
accidentally locked in to interpreting mm. events around us with a you. I see you doing this, or you're doing that because, or you make me I... feel blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And this one, this uh, number five challenges us to invite back this sense of beauty and and empathy that uh, we often have to practice because again in the anxiety of our culture we don't know how to just kind of embrace this and and this rule helps us to discipline ourselves to use the term if this were my dream in my imagined version of the dream it helps the dreamer the original dreamer not feel like they're being analyzed because they are not yeah and it also makes us a, a community invites us to be one with each other even as we are not comfortable doing that that is out of our comfort zone and to borrow the dream and to speak from the i speak yeah. from in my imagined version helps us to own this energy this possibility th these truths inside of us and then the dreamer the original dreamer can kind of like relax and say you know what i hear that person saying it does give me goosebumps mm -hmm. or it it doesn't, doesn't so yeah. this is a gentle invitation for us to join each other with our blessed imagination in order to explore the deeper meanings of how the dream does come for all of us, not just for the dreamer. Yeah, and you know, this is where it works both ways, as we say so often, because mm -hmm. as I'm making the comment on someone's dream, in my imagined version, this mm -hmm. dream might have something to do with my relationship with my mother. <laughs> it's a classic one I always use. Um, mm -hmm. But if I say, I think your dream means that you have a problem with your mother, that immediately becomes accusatory and the dreamer will shut down and not want to hear that. But if I put it in the eye, then the dreamer can take it or leave it. But I also can hear myself saying it. So I realize it's true for me too. And this is where we get into the realm of compassion because if I'm able to imagine someone else's dream and truly imagine what their life circumstances might be, then that then that means that I can have compassion for them. If I'm not able to, to imagine their lives, imagine being them, I cannot have compassion for them. Mm -hmm. So that's really critical. Very, very well said. I, I, one of the great truths I've learned in my years of working with dreams from a projective standpoint is to, it, in my profession as a psychotherapist, marriage and family therapist, there's always this kind of setup, uh, and it's not always bad, and it is a setup where someone comes to me and they're asking me to help them deal with their life issues. And, and so the you word tends to get used and and in a sense it's like sometimes that violates uh, clinical psychotherapy accidentally violates a person's dream if they say well this is what's going on when you are dreaming such and such <laughs> and it's like okay it's not that that isn't true however it is interpreting the person's soul rather than letting the person set with their insight, they may not be ready for that insight. And if I say, well, this is what you're thinking, or this is what you're doing in your dream, that pushes them. And it, again, violates that sacredness of a person exploring on their own. Now, if I borrowed it and said, you know, this is what this reminds me of, if this were my dream in my imagination, it's like, oh, well, Royce, that, that's really off the wall <laughs> or that's really on target. And however, it builds this beautiful bridge of humanity 
Yeah, it's a, it builds a container, a safe container, because it's I've seen a lot of dream work done not in the projective form. And I've witnessed a lot of people's feelings get very hurt. And I've watched people run out of the room because it became so direct and everyone projected so strongly onto the dreamer. And that doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help the dreamer. It doesn't help anybody else in the workshop or the setting or the group, whatever. And, and it's, it, it's, you know, I like to immerse completely into it to where even when I'm asking the questions and I encourage a lot of people that I work with um, to keep the questions in the eye too, like, what color, you know, what color is my dress? Uh, what, what uh, model car am I driving? Um, what, what does my house look like? You know, that kind of thing. Because then I, I'm still, because if I go into the you, well, what, what are you, what, what does your dress look like? Immediately that again becomes um, outside of me. But if I'm imagining myself truly in the dream, then I have to see myself as that dreamer and, and see myself in that, in that, clothing and in, in that car, wherever. So that's one other piece to it as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the sixth and final toolkit is mm -hmm. all dream group participants should agree at the onset to remain to maintain anonymity. Oops, anonymity mm -hmm. in all discussions of dream work. In the absence of any specific request for confidentiality, group members should be free to discuss their experiences openly outside the group, provided no other dreamer is identifiable in their stories. However, whenever any group member requests confidentiality, all members should agree to be bound automatically by such a request. Mm, yeah. Here we go again with building a safe container. This is a very important piece and it, it's easy to skip over it if you're trying to save time <laughs> introducing the, the workshop or whatever. But it's very important that people understand this that to not say, well, you know, the other day I was working on this dream with Viviana and, you know, Viviana and I start using Viviana's name or I was working on this dream with Royce and it's like, wait a minute. Did Royce give me permission to use his name? And immediately I'm going to be revealing something about his personal life that he may or may not want it want revealed. And it's so it's um, it's important to see, you know, to say it like I usually say, like, you know, please go ahead and sh with my people I work with and workshops, I say, please go ahead and share what happened at the workshop, but please don't attach the dreamers name to the dream. So in other words, that frees people up to be able to discuss it so that other others can hear about it. Uh, but yes, the last bit's very, very important. Um, sometimes people uh, discuss things about their family life or things about their work life that they really don't want repeated. So they'll preface it with that. This is a this dream. I'm sharing it, but but um, I, I'm I'm requesting strict re confidentiality. And uh, at what you're reminding me of, Billy, in this is uh, the dream knows where the dream wants to go, but the dreamer may not know where the dream wants to go. And, and so when I'm sharing a dream, uh, and it's a profound dream, and there's multiple level, levels of meaning, and I've, and I've had this happen numerous times where it's like, one of the ahas is, oh my God, what? Oh, I didn't know the dream was going to talk about this. <laughs> and I'm my ego self, my waking self, my you know normal uh, self-protective self isn't ready consciously to talk about that. Right. Or if it is, I need to have this safe container. I didn't know the dream was going there. Mm. And so when we in advance bless everyone with uh, this safety and say, you know, we don't know where the dream's going. And the dream wants to be here, is here for our health and wholeness and insight and wisdom and healing. Yeah. We need to agree up front, we're going to protect the dreamer yeah. with our compassion and our empathy. 
And again, the dream is my dream that comes from someone else so that we have this beautiful, beautiful human connection of being supportive and loving even beyond what we may consciously realize. Right, very nice. Okay, I'm gonna stop the share now. And if anybody wants to learn more about that, they can go to jeremytaylor.com. It's up and it's on my website as well, wakeuptoyourdreams.com. And it is on my website uh, as well. Uh, and uh, so, Royce and, and Viviana, thank you. For, com. <laughs> right? That's, that's the Roy, new. Roy, RoyceFitz.com. Yes. Yeah. Viviana, thank you for reading through those. And uh, uh, it, it helps to have another person uh, mm. read through it. I feel it, hear it, experience the words in a, in a deeper, richer way. I was first introduced to those when I took Billy's workshop and she read through them all and I was new to your whole circle here and I, I found it interesting and it, you know I came in but then every month when I go through the dreams uh, groups I attend the dream groups and I do my private sessions with Billy I hear it I hear it I hear it every it repeated over and over so it was fabulous to really look at it again because now I really got it <laughs> I think it like dreams it just takes takes a while and you can it's always searching you're always finding deeper meaning and it's just brilliant it's beautiful it is I'm, and it's so it's so simple yeah and i i love that one of the primary uh passions jeremy has and that i believe we have is to level this ground of dreamers mm -hmm. it's not just about experts analyzing and scientific studies it is that and yeah. more importantly in my projection it's about common ordinary folks who are changing the world through dreaming and 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 so that simple six step <laughs> used to be 10 jeremy oh, condensed it used to be a yeah. lot more than that if you, his original yeah. book in in the 80s dream work went on for like two pages it was like 20 oh. 25. Yeah. <laughs> i just yeah. looked at that not too long ago and yeah. i thought oh yeah. my goodness i'm so glad that he that he, i'm turning through the pages and i'm like i'm so glad he's he condensed it down and i i many times i heard him talking about how that took him so long to get to that part where it was just this is really what i'm trying to say instead of saying all this other stuff attached to it i'm just trying to say this and that's why at the bottom if you notice it says copyright jeremy taylor however uh distribution is is uh on on a, on a what how does he put it it's like uh, I forget, but it's, permission is permission is given. Is that what you're saying? No, to but it's even funnier than to that. be distributed widely. To oh, be distributed yeah. widely. That's what it says at the bottom. Something like you know, as long as you keep as long as you keep that Jeremy Taylor at the bottom, just make as many copies as you want and send it out. That was his goal was to to spread it to the world. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. a perfect manifesto. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs>